Um, okay, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Henry Jeffrey, and I'm a, a researcher within the within within IES. Um, and so, what I'd like to talk to you around over the next sort of half hour or so is ocean energy, wave and tidal, but not just to speak about sort of the things that are very technical, because clearly there's a lot of very very technical people in this room, as we've seen from the from the four new PhD students with their very interesting projects, but look at the wider spectrum of what else is involved in developing a, a sector in the in, in wave, and, wave and tidal power. So although I don't have a slide on sort of why I like gaming and why I don't play bass guitar, I do have a slide on a little bit of my background. I'm actually quite new to academia. Um, I'm originally uh, an engineer from the oil and gas sector working on and offshore and overseas. And then I transitioned to be a project engineer in the green renewable sector about um, just over 10, 10 years ago, where I went to be a project engineer with what was WaveGen, um, which installed the world's first grid-connected commercial wave power plant in Isla. Um, that plant is, has since been de decommissioned, but nonetheless it was sort of a milestone in my career at the time. My current roles is um, within the Institute I work for Supergen Marine. Many of you may have been at the, the conference um, la last week. If you weren't, I'll give you a little bit of a flavour for that. But I work for a number of other organisations such as the UK Energy Research Centre, the European Energy Research Alliance, um, the International Energy Agency, and most recently Wave Energy Scotland. So I'll, give, I'll touch on these as I go through my, my, my presentation. So what I'd like to cover this afternoon is give it an overview of how the sector works overall. Because in order for any sector to progress, you do need political will. So I'll touch on that and how that works and how that influences what happens, not just at a research level, but at all the different levels of the sector's production. I'll speak something about the technology challenges. I'll speak about the roadmaps and strategies that various countries have in order to develop sectors in wave and tidal power. And then I'll finish off with some examples of European projects and collaborations that underpin that progression, and finally with some international visions as what other countries are doing and how they see the, the progression of this sector. So what we have uh, in this slide is sort of all the different elements of the sector. And for those of you at the back, you guys are all at the bottom here. You guys are these very clever looking people down in the, in the bottom of the screen here doing the under, underpinning research. But in order to sort of make that happen and turn that into industrial commercial sector, which is why we're doing this research, it's to underpin econo economic growth, you need a number of other players there. So you need the government in order to have a vision that they would like to see wave and tidal power as part of their supply chain. You then need, governments need to have funding agencies to make, make that happen. Those funding agencies will then fund technology developers. If those technology developers are successful, then you'll need project developers. Those project developers will need to have a supply chain of technology providers that give them the subsystems and components. And then last but not least, you need the regulators, because you can, it's all very well having the most successful technology in the world, but if you don't have a successful regulation regime in order to get planning permission, then you, then you don't have a sector. So all of these things are like key in the progression of this industry that many of us work in in this, in this room. And although we all work in this sort of bottom very important segment, it is just one segment of how the, the overall sector com comes together. Now with regard to political will, I used to show this slide and I used to have Alex Salmond there representing the Scottish Government. And, and whatever you think of Alex Salmond, Alex Salmond was a real proponent of wave and tidal power. He worked very hard with regard to the policies that were put in place in order to make wave and tidal power in Scotland a reality and make sure it was a well-funded sector. Now, when Nicola Sturgeon took over with regard to being, being First Minister, I was unsure because she is a, a real advocate for, for health and health care. And I asked myself, is she a driver? Is she a driving force in taking forward the political will for wave and tide? I don't know. However, last night I was at the Green Energy Awards and Nicola Sturgeon gave the opening address to the Green, Ener Green Energy Awards and a more convincing speech you could not have heard with regard to not just Scotland's commitment and future commitment to renewables, but also the future commitment in wave and, tide, wave and tidal power. Now, I'm not very easily convinced by speeches and so if I'm convinced, then I think it must have been quite, quite convincing. 
Moving to UK government, I think less convincing. Um, there's been a significant pullback. If we look at Amber Rudd's speech, you know, she does not say the words waving title with regard to their commitment to, to the future. So although David Cameron has said you know, that this will be the, you know, the greenest um, administration ever, with regard to the sort of the funding for waving title power that's been in the past, this is a question mark for me with regard to whether the political will is there at a, at a UK level. I'm not saying it's not there, but I think there's a question mark over the, the continued interest from the UK government in waving wave tidal power. Now, as I'll show you, waving tidal power, the UK is just a single player in an international marketplace. So the significance of that you can judge as we go, go through this presentation. Now, in order to fund the sector, once you've got political will, they need to put political instruments in place in order to make sure that the sector get, gets funded. And you need to have a number of policies, whether it be the underpinning research, so all of you guys are here, and then you move, move forward to development, to demonstration, and then to the overall deployment and rollout of the technology. And in the UK, we have a very complex mix of um, policies and funding to make that happen. So we have the underpinning research, such as Supergen. Many of you are fund funded through that, and the other re research councils. Um, then we have a range of, of other elements that move further up the TRL, the technology readiness levels, with regard to people that fund um, not just um, research, but fund applied research. Then there are organisations such as the Energy Technology Institute and the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult that try and bridge that gap between the underpinning research and the overall sort of applied research, so it could be picked up by, by industry. There are funding bodies um, that focus on just funding industry. They don't fund academia or researchers. They only fund, fund the industry. And then there are the deployment mechanisms. So rather than giving money for developing technology, they try and stimulate a market. So rather than giving you a million pounds to develop a piece of kit, they will say, OK, for every megawatt hour you produce, we will give you an enhanced rate for that power. And so what I'm trying to sort of encapsulate here is that there's a whole range of things that are like what I describe as technology push, trying to advance the technology on the left-hand side, and then market pool enhancements for like the deployment of the technology, and blending these all together are what makes the political will and turn that, turn that into, into a sector. So... I think it's quite a complex landscape, quite hard to sort of understand and see how it all fits, fits together. There will be overlaps there, but I think the advantage of this in the UK, if one bit isn't working well, it doesn't mean that the whole sector, sector falls over. If you looked at this in the, in the US, then you would see the US Department of Energy did all of this, all of it themselves. So there are advantages and disadvantages. It might be a simpler system to, to un undertake, but I think there are advantages with the UK system as well and I'm not saying that, that one is right over over the other over the other. Now if you do get that right, what does that what does that mean? So this is a piece of um, market allocation modeling um, that shows if wave and tidal is successful and it might mean successful with regard to having the right cost, having the right performance, having the right reliability because um, it, it, in order to do that, it needs to, or in order for it to be successful, those costs of reliability figures need to compete with everything else that's on offer. And so Wave and Tidal does not have a divine right to be deployed. It needs to compete in the rest of the energy mix with everything else. So it's got to be as cheap, as reliable, as good at performing. And this piece of, of model, modelling work done by the UK Energy Research Centre shows that if we get everything right, and you know, and that's a big if, there's a lot of work to, work to, work to do there, then that shows that by 2050, that could be 20 gigawatts of, of deployed capacity in, in the UK. Now, that's a big if, but it, that shows that if the, if the market mechanisms are correct, then that's how much deploy, deployment we could have. That's about 15% of what the overall deployed capacity in the UK would be, would be by 2050. And so that's a very significant chunk of what the, what the overall prize would be. And it's, in, and it's important to recognise that there is a significant overall prize, because if you don't show a significant overall prize, then the policy maker will not be interested and there will be no political will in order to drive all those other mechanisms that allow you to like, do your underpinning research, that they see an attractive end game that makes it worthwhile putting in political will, putting in those mechanisms 
I, I, I describe to make it attractive. Now, I said that um, that's a, it's a big if. There are a lot of things to get right. And the most important thing, or one of the most important things to get right, is the technology, is the technology itself, to make sure it performs well and is reliable. Now, there are a whole range of things to do here. We heard about the sort of people doing very interesting things on CFD or whether it be in sort of grid, grid, grid modelling. But I like to think of the technology challenges in wave and tidal affectionately as the illities. And I put a, a screen up here of going, the technology that you develop needs to be scalable, it needs to be predictable, it needs to be manufacturable at the right cost, it then needs to be installable, it needs to be straightforward to operate, it definitely needs to be survivable, along with that reliable, and at the end of the day, doing all of those things, it needs to be affordable. And it's not just the, the overall device, the, that device will be broken down into various subsystems that you need to all of get that you get all of them right in order to make the overall product attractive. And when I say breaking them down, you need to achieve all of those things in the structure, the moorings, the power takeoff, your grid connection, your operation and maintenance, the infrastructure that you have for installing those devices the, in the overall in control of it. So it's very interesting that once you think, you know, I need to do this at the very high level so I can have that 20 gigawatts of deployed capacity, you then break that down into what I would describe as more manageable chunks. And I need to get all these different components right in order to have this overall device that's correct, along with everything else to make there be political will to take, take the sector, sector forward. Now, under each of those, those topics, you could get like a whole range of other topics that you'd go, okay, for moorings and foundations, we need to look at like tidal turbulence, we need to look at fatigue. And so you end up with almost an enormous, unmanageable list of things that the underpinning researchers in this room need to solve. So in order to make that manageable, what you need to do is that you need to prioritise. And so this is a piece of work by the Energy Technologies Institute that looks at if we just ask people what's important in the sector, you will have this unmanageable list. And so you then need to have some sort of um, triage mechanism that says, OK, what are the most important things that we need to do? That if we don't do these tomorrow, then it won't let the sector go forward. And there'll be things with regard to saying one of the main metrics that's used is that if it's transferable from another sector, if it's going to be solved by defence, for instance, then the wave and tidal sector doesn't need to work on it. And you would then end up with a much smaller list um, of the things that you, that, you need to, that you need to focus on. And it's too small to read from the back, but this is what this chart is showing, or what the main priority activities, activities are. And I've blown them up into, into areas with regard to the overall device subsystems, what we need to do for optimization tools and what we need to, to do, do for arrays. So there's a mechanism there in order to prioritize the activities that researchers work on and industry work on in order to get those things right to take the, take the technology, technology forward. Now I mentioned that, um, that one of my roles with, with Supergen and many of you will have been at the Supergen COD conference um, last week. Hands up, who was all at the Supergen conference last week? Yeah, about a third of you. And so apologies to, to you guys, because you've probably like sort of see, seen this before. But everything that happens in Supergen has to be based on that list. Supergen can't just go and work on whatever it, whatever it feels like doing. It's a whole consortium of UK universities coming together to share information and expertise led by Edinburgh, but we bring them together so we make sure that like Cambridge University isn't doing the very same thing as, as Imperial or Dundee or, or, or Edinburgh. They come together to share their information so they don't duplicate and replicate the efforts that they're doing. And where there is some overlap, they're able to share results in order to increase the, over, the overall quality of, of what happens. But the work, stuff that they get to work on is only stuff that's been highlighted in that um, list I had earlier. And it won't be a word-to-word -word, um, compa comparison there. You see arrays and farms, turbulence, extreme loadings, um, components. And each of these will fit under one of, one of those priorities. And so when you wonder why, you know, what happens that there's all these very interesting presentations at the Supergen conference, it's not by chance. 
it's because they are part of the overall jigsaw of putting things together to, to build, build an industry. And starting at the very sort of underpinning level, which is um, the, the researchers themselves building up towards having, having an overall industry. So the other topics of Moorings and Foundations, power takeoff, environmental impact, all of which have been identified by industry as the things that they need in order to drive the sector forward, maintain political will and have deployments. I did have some very attractive videos to show you here when I first came down to the room. They are no longer, no longer working, so you'll just have to take my, 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 my word for it. But this gives an example of where different um, universities in the UK are working on, on projects on raising farms, on extreme loading and survivability and tidal in, in, this, in this instance, um, and on extreme loadings and survivability both in, in wave and tidal and, and the blades. And that's all because they've been identified as priorities in, in the sector that are part of the, the overall picture in order to have the political will to make this se sector uh, a reality. Now, when we solve these things and make them all, all, work, all work together in the UK and we decide going, yes, we've solved these things and we know exactly how to build a, a tidal turbine blade or to build a... Uh, the structure of a, of a hull or we've worked out the best way to measure resource assessment of like the overall resource in, in UK waters. What we don't want to happen is when we build an industry is for that not to be replicatable overseas because any government that's um, supporting this sector is interested in three main things. They're interested of course in the carbon savings um, they are interested in the security of supply from a low carbon technology, but what they are really interested in, or what they are especially interested in, are the jobs and the economic benefits that building a sector, sector brings with them. And so in order for that to happen, they're not just, they don't just want to deploy these technologies in the UK, they want UK industry to deploy these technologies in the UK and to export them overseas. So the last thing that they want is somebody to like have done uh, a tidal performance curve for your tidal turbine in the UK and find that that's not accepted by the, the market that you have in Korea to, to export that to. So there's an organisation called the International Electrotechnical Commission that brings the experts together. So if you're doing like a, a wave power matrix in the, in the UK um, or a tidal power um, curve in the UK, it's been it's been agreed with an international community the common way that everybody agrees it's the right way to do it. And so we don't end up in the situation where you know, when I go anywhere I have to travel with my travel plug because everybody's got like a different socket. This is avoiding the travel plug for the, for the wave and tidal sector, having a common approach whether you're in the US, Chile, Korea on, on how you do things. And this is an example of, of some of the areas you know, wave and tidal performance, measure, measuring the resource, the overall all design, design codes, doing this in a common way so that when you're building a sector, you can build a sector um, internationally, not just in whichever country you're in. Because this is what we're doing in the UK, but equally people in the US are involved in this process because they want to sell stuff to the, to the UK, not just deploy it in the, in the US or export it to any, any, other, any other foreign market. So, on the foreign markets, I'd like to then sort of speak a little bit about different countries' roadmaps and strategies, because it's quite easy to think that the UK and Scotland is the only people that are interested in, in wave, wave and tidal power, because it's, it's not the case. Many other countries are, 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 are interested, and they all have, you know, what they will call, or, or many of them have, either a roadmap or a strategy, so when I say a roadmap or a strategy, a future plan as to what they would like to do. So these um, countries will have political will and they, they will have a target as to what they want, want to do. This is uh, some quotes from the International Energy Agency that gives uh, an overview of what roadmaps are for and they say they're an effective tool to underpin the policies that I mentioned before, it gives you direction and it allows you to focus on the investments to accelerate the the technology development and give a coherent approach um, with, with the global market. So everything that I was mentioning about in the UK, having like an overall target, that 20 gigawatts we, we could get, 
what are the right policies we put in place to exploit that 20 gigawatts and how can we engage export te technologies overseas, overseas as well. There are two main types of, of roadmap. You either have a, a deployment roadmap where, you know, for instance, France could say, I'd like to have 10 gigawatts by ne next week. What is it that I need to do to do it? Or you can have a development roadmap that says, OK, if I am to have 10 gigawatts by next week, there are a lot of technology challenges. And what are those technology challenges? So in order, you know, a roadmap to develop the either technology or a roadmap to deploy the technology, or some of them are a combination uh, be between, between the two. And I'll just take you through some of the, the country's um, plans. This is the, the 2010 Marine Action Plan from, from DEC. I don't know how much of this is valid anymore, given what I said earlier with regard to what I consider to be um, the UK's political will. But nonetheless, at the time, they had a combination of a deployment and a development roadmap. They were saying, one to two gigawatts by 2020. Clearly, that's not go going to happen. But nonetheless, that was that was their, their aim. And then they would have like a plan in place with what they had to do with regard to planning, what finance mechanisms. In this case, it would be the market pool mechanisms that I mentioned at the right hand slide of that TRL level. What infrastructure would they need to put in place with regard to? Do we need to build build ports and harbours? Do we need to build new vessels? Do we need to do soft infrastructure like sort of training for health and safety for the personnel operating these devices? And last but not least, the regulation and legislation, making sure that there is a fit for purpose mechanism that if you want to go and build a 400 megawatt tidal farm in the Pentlid Firth, there are the right consenting processes to, to allow that to happen. So that's a UK example. If we go to, to Europe, the, the latest document to come out of Europe is from the Ocean Energy Forum. And so this is bringing together European funders and looking at what the, the opportunities are. It doesn't actually have a target in place with regard to what the overall um, vision of the deployed capacity will be. But it, what it does have is that it has plans in place for first and foremost the consenting, so that planning permission I mentioned, finance, whether it be like technology push and market pool, and also the technology themselves. And so they're identifying, you know, I've got examples there about the subsystems, increasing reliability in order to take the sector forward in, in Europe. Moving across the Atlantic, the US has a roadmap in place, very much a deployment roadmap, where they're indicating their high level targets of like 15 gigawatts by, by 20, 2030. They're not telling you how they're going to do it. They're just saying that they're doing it in an economical and environmentally and socially responsible manner. Um, quite easy to say, quite hard, quite hard to do. Um, also in North America, Canada have a, have a roadmap with regard to their vision and they have incremental targets of what they would like to, to have, in, have in place. But they've also <coughs> said that they want to bring <coughs> 2 billion in an, annual income. So when I said that, you know, that countries are interested in security of supply, carbon savings, but they're really interested in economic benefit, the Canadians are being really quite upfront about they're really interested in the, in the economic benefit. So they are being quite explicit with regard to what their ov overall, overall driver is. Moving back a little, little closer, closer to home, um, Ireland have, have their targets for 20, 29 gigawatt. And again, they're being sort of, you know, quite upfront with regard to this is the potential cumulative benefit, 120 billion euros that they believe can come from this sector and up to 70,000 jobs. So they're also quite clear with regard to, you know, one of their drivers is the economic benefit and the have it, having jobs in their, in their in their home country. This is a roadmap that I actually worked with the Chilean Energy, Energy Ministry on uh, a couple of years ago, and they were unsure as to whether they were going to engage in the wave and tidal sector or not. They have a fantastic resource. Chile has one of the best wave resources in the world. And they put a roadmap in place, not to say this is what we're going to do. They put a roadmap in place to say, Let's measure what the opportunity is, see what the economic and jobs and, um, and security of supply benefits could be, and then we will decide if it's something that we want to engage in. And they had two questions that they wanted to answer, because clearly they have a fantastic resource, um, but what do they do with that resource? Because they could either choose to do nothing, sit and wait for the overall price of wave and tidal technology to come to a point where it was made 
economic benefit to deploy, and then they could deploy it, and then they would get security of supply and carbon savings, but they'd get no jobs. Um, so that was one option for them. Um, the second option was to say, OK, let's identify if there are areas where the Chilean supply chain can add an economic benefit. They recognised that they were probably too late to become the latest developer of wave or tidal technology, but they may have had expertise in the supply chain to say that they're real black belts in doing operations and maintenance or some, something, something similar. And the outcome of that was that they would like to have some combination of the, of the two, that they would do pilot plants in the first instance, so they would learn about having the right regulation and legislation to put in place, at the same time learning about what the potential supply chain in Chile could be and what their input could be now and what their input could be in the future if they made the right training, training investments. Um, this is a, a roadmap that's, that's ongoing by some of my research group that I don't know if are here or not. Oh, no, so I see Samantha there. Um, they're working on a, on a roadmap for Panama. And this is similar to Chile, where they're lo looking at going, what's the opportunity in Panama? And looking at what are the opportunities, looking at the resource, what technology do they have available in the supply chain, what infrastructure do they have, what do we need to do for the regulation and legislation. They just held the, the workshop in Panama with the stakeholders um, last week in order to sort of find out what the information is on the ground because it's all very well us sitting in here in Edinburgh giving advice but we need to go to, to Panama and so they're just back from Panama last week and we'll be putting together a set of recommendations to the, the Panama Energy Ministry with regard to the opportunities that Panama has in the wave and tidal sector. So hopefully that's giving you an overview that although you know, the UK is seen as a leader in this field, there are many other countries internationally that are very interested in this sector. And so, um, but I am going to come back and say that you know, although you know, all of those other countries are important and they are very interested, I think all of those countries still look to the UK and Europe to be the real leaders in the, in the field. So I'd like to give a, a, just a couple of examples of of European projects and, and collaborations that are be, being put in place to allow us to keep that lead um, with regard to um, the pr progression of the, of the sector. So here in Edinburgh, we are very successful in engagement in, in Euro Euro European projects. You know, so rather, and when I say European projects, these are projects funded by the Europe European Commission. So rather than one member state, such as like the UK or France, just doing it on their own, they put money into a com common pot and the European Union will then fund projects that they believe that are be a benefit to the, to the over overall sector. So there are a number of, of projects here. Um, I'll highlight DT Ocean. Um, my colleague um, David Bould um, spoke about that quite extensively, maybe not last week, but, but the week, about week before, so I won't say any, any more about that. But there are a number of, of projects that look at either tools for the sector, deployments of um, wave, wave and tidal power in large arrays, um, underpinning research. So all of the things I showed back on that first slide of the different TRL levels and the different types of projects from underpinning research right through to, to the deployments, there, although that's happening in the UK and being funded by the UK, it's also happening with the, with the Euro Euro European Commission. So it's very important that there is an engagement with the European Commission in order to ensure that they are not duplicating what's happening in the member states and it is, is complementary. And there are a number of ways that, that we can do that. The, the main mechanism that Europe has, their funding programme that does all this work is called Horizon 2020 and it has a, a number of areas that fund wave, wave and tidal power. And so in order to shoot, ensure that there isn't that duplication and replication of what's happening in the member states, then there needs to be lobbying of the European Commission for the UK to say, this is what we'd like you to fund, Mr or Mrs European Commission, um, and this is what we think you, you, you shouldn't fund. And that happens through a number of organi organisations. Um, OEE stands for, for Ocean Energy Europe. Um, Edinburgh holds a seat on the, on the board, and that's Europe's largest lobbying organisation to lobby the European Commission. So you would feed information into Ocean Energy Europe, and then they would go and see ministers and project officers in the European Commission to ensure that the Horizon 2020 work programme we believed, were, we believed was suitable. Another organisation that I'll speak a little bit more about is ERA, the European Energy Research Alliance. That's the equivalent of an association, 
but for the for the research sector to make sure that what's happening in the UK isn't being duplicated by what's happening in France or, or Germany, um, etc. And there's a couple of others there. TP Ocean, that's the technology platform for ocean, and the Ocean Energy Forum, which is the roadmap that, that, that I mentioned mentioned earlier. But the one I will speak a little bit more about is ERA, the European Energy Research Alliance. Now, when I mentioned Supergen to begin with, um, about saying we bring everybody, all the UK universities together to make sure that there isn't this overlap between what's happening in Edinburgh and what's happening in Imperial or, or Southampton, I class um, ERA as the European example of that. And so ERA wants to make sure that what's happening in Supergen isn't being duplicated by what's happening in Technali in Spain, by Fraunhofer in Germany, by Marentech in Norway, the large national labs in all, in, all of these, in all of these other countries. So there are nine countries signed up to this in order to share their information so that they can, where there is an overlap, they can try and avoid that by adjusting the work programme, or if that's unavoidable, in the same way as Supergen, they share their information to increase the overall competitiveness and the quality of the, of the, work, that they, uh, the work that they do. Because in the same way that the UK wants to export, Europe wants to export as well. So Europe wants to be more competitive than North America or, the, or than China. And this is the way that they do it, to bring the, bring the mem member, states to, mem member states together. So I'll just finish off with some um, an, an international as aspects of it. So we've spoken about the, the UK, we've spoken about the roadmaps in the, in, in the other countries, and I'd just like to speak about uh, an organisation that brings all of, those, all of those things together. This is a slide that I, I use when I'm sort of speaking about, about Supergen, and it goes out of date almost by, by the day with the sort of the number of countries in the world that Supergen has, has collaborations in. In all of those countries, we have collaborations with them because they have, a, have an interest in it. And so all of those countries that have an interest in it are also members of the International Energy Agency. And the International Energy Agency has a special initiative for ocean energy, what we'll even tidal power, um, including um, OTEC and salinity gradient as well. And it brings together 21 countries. So in the same way that I've said that Supergen avoids duplication at a UK level, ERA, Ocean Energy Europe, are avoiding duplication at a European level. The International Ed Energy Agency initiative on, on ocean energy does this at an international level. So as 21 countries um, signed, up, signed up to it, and so whether it's like Taiwan, Korea, um, North, North America, um, there are 21 countries there. I was at the last meeting um, three weeks ago in, in Mexico. Mexico just joined as a, as, a, as a member, and so I was interested. We had the Conuset them funded student, student earlier. And so they provide that job by having uh, an intergovernmental organization. So when I said right at the beginning of the speech that there was um, all of these policies that needed to be in alignment in order to build, build the sector, these were the intergovernmental organisations that set policy and so who better to make sure that your policies don't overlap than the policy makers themselves. So a very different organisation to perhaps a, a trade association speaking to each, each other or researchers speaking, speaking to each other but an intergovernmental organisation it's sort of the underpinning roots of policy making and so to ensure that there is a joined up approach at an international level um, you can rest assured that there is an organisation setting that over, over, overall agenda. They do individual pieces of work that are best suited to an intergovernmental organisation. They do vision setting with regard to, I showed the, the slide of the, of the UK and the 20 gigawatts possibility. They've done that very same exercise at an international level and you can probably can't sort of read the the screen up at the top there, but what that says is if we do get the technology right, there's in excess of 330 gigawatts of deployed capacity available for wave and tidal power by 2050, but it also recognises that there will be 1.2 million um, direct jobs in a certain amount of, of carbon saved. So even the International Energy Agency realises that all of its country members are interested in the carbon savings, the security of supply but very much in, interested in the, in the jobs. They have a number of reports on the international level cost of energy, 
where technology is available overseas. In the UK, we very much look at the oil and gas sector for technology transfer. But if you're in um, South Korea, then you have a very different supply chain that you, that you have an offer to you. So it highlights um, the, those, those, those initiatives. One of the the latest initiatives is also looking at international test centres. In the UK, we have EMEC in, in Orkney, and they have an initiative to say, OK, how could EMEC in Orkney share its um, learning and understanding with all the other tech test centres test centers around, the, around the world? So hopefully I've given you an overview of what the political will is that um, is needed to drive the sector, what the technology challenges are and how they're prioritised because they have to be in alignment with commercial challenges. You can't just do a technology challenges because you're interested in it. The roadmaps and strategies that other countries have put in place with regard to what they're interested in and what their ambitions are and wave, wave, wave and tidal power. Some of the European projects and collaborations that do that at a European level to enhance our competitiveness. <coughs> and then finally, the international progress and visions that the International Energy Agency has, has. So I did start with this slide, and I want to end with this slide, is that I showed that there was these very clever looking people down at the, at the bottom here that were interested in research and progressing, progressing the sector. But we did need you know, all of these other sectors, from the government to the funders to the different types of project and technology developers and the supply chain and the, and the regulators. And what I'd just like to sort of leave you with the note that although many of you are very, very specialised in the subject area that you're working in, whether it be finite element or fluid dynamics or overall resource assessment or, or modelling, although you're very, very focused right now in here, then all of these other organisations have a real need for people that have that technical understanding in order to get that whole political will, all of those funding mechanisms together. So I think that sort of in that supply chain, whether it be the technology developers, funders, regulators, project developers, there's an opportunity for all of you in those areas. So when you're thinking about sort of what you're doing with the rest of your career, whether you're staying as one of these very clever people down at the bottom, there are other opportunities for you because the sector is made up not just of researchers, but of a whole range of um, um, sort of other organisations and other initiatives and other requirements to make it successful. I'm going to stop talking now, <laughs> but thanks very much for your attention. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.